Welcome everyone to the winter webinar series. I'm here with Dr. Shannon Coleman and we're going to be talking about best practices for food safety today. As you know, this is part of a three-part webinar series. This is the last session, so we've been really glad to have you along for the ride talking about hunger in Iowa, talking about how to work best with food banks, and today we're going to be talking specifically about food safety. A few materials that we have for you today. You've got a handout so you can follow along with your notes and also you've got places where you can write down notes from your discussions. We've also got the evaluation so please uh, be sure to fill out the evaluation form. And also we've got the grant guidelines so you can learn more about the mini grant that we've been pushing you to, to apply for this whole time. And today in terms of where we're headed and with food safety, we're going to be talking about terms. Shannon's going to lead us through a food safety plan, and then we're also going to talk about food safety best practices in general. So as you know, this, this food security project is a collaboration between SNAP-ED, so the, the Supplemental Nutrition Education Program, and the Master Gardener Program, and the idea is that we can make fruits and vegetables more accessible by working through food banks and pantries. So Master Gardeners are already doing this work and we want to provide you with additional support so that you feel like you can help increase food security in your community. As you know, the three pieces of this project, one is the webcast, which we're doing today. The other is that we've got demonstration gardens across the state. And then the third piece is the mini grant that we're really hoping you're going to apply for these $1,000 mini grants. As you know, we've got seven demonstration gardens across the state, and at each, each of these demonstration gardens is at a research farm, and this year they're going to be growing crops that work well with the food bank system. So these are the 10 crops here that are going to be grown, and these are some photos from previous years in the Rock Rapids demonstration gardens, and these are really beautiful thanks to the work of Master Gardeners. And if you do have a demonstration garden near you, please be sure to reach out and see if you could be of help. If it's a little too far away to volunteer there on a regular basis, feel free to drop by and take a tour of the demonstration garden, and also come to the gardens uh, in the late summer to the field days so that you can see how everything's been growing. Each one of these seven demonstration gardens will have a field day in the late summer, so stay tuned for details on that. So as you know, the mini grants, you can apply for up to $1,000 to cover costs of your Master Gardener project and we want you to put in that application by March 1st, so you've got a little bit of time left to get that application in. And as you know, these mini grants are focused on three different aspects that we saw Master Gardeners were already doing to increase food security. So one is teach, the other is connect, and the third is grow. So teaching, we talk about giving presentations to low-income families about gardening. Connect would be connecting gardeners and farmers to food banks so that we're increasing the amount of poundage of fresh produce going into the food banks. And grow is when you are, as master gardeners, growing food, um, in, in some cases thousands of pounds of, of fresh produce for the food banks. I wanted to give you a few examples of master gardeners in action for the connect aspect of the mini grants. And I want you to pay attention to these examples of Connect and think about the allowable expenses for the mini grant. So think about maybe what could be purchased for these different demonstration uh, gardens or these different volunteer projects based on the mini grant allowable expenses. So there are three examples that I wanted to highlight today, and again, Master Gardeners are growing a lot of food for food banks. So these are this is just a tiny um, sample of what's going on around the state. The first one I wanted to talk about was in Cerro Gordo County, and this is the Mason City Community Garden. Now this community garden is like most community gardens in that anybody can pay to have a plot to grow vegetables. However, the Master Gardeners also 
use some of the plots to grow food for the food bank and also the the Cerro Gordo Extension has partnered with the food bank to bring in food bank clients to grow their own vegetables. So people who are visiting the food bank are also growing their food in this garden and also food from this garden is being donated to the food bank. And one other partner that's been supporting this project has been the Blue Zones program. In Dubuque County, the St. Luke's Garden is another great example of a collaborative project where master gardeners are volunteering. This is on a private acreage and the food is going to the free meal program that's hosted at the St. Luke's Church and master gardeners come out to this garden to volunteer to grow food and that food then goes into those free meals and also into the food banks. And this garden is part of the Dubuque Coalition of Community Gardens, so it's part of a network of really fantastic community gardens that are helping to provide space for people to grow their own food and also provide more food into the food bank system and also to homeless shelters. And there's a really big garden over in Bremer County. As you know, flooding uh, really affected Waverly and so they took four lots where they'd previously been houses and created community gardens. They've been growing thousands of pounds of vegetables for the food bank, and they've also started an orchard, so they've got some perennial fruits that are also going to be donated to the food bank. And I just wanted to take a second to watch a really great video about the Waverly Community Garden. Growing produce for those in need is what the Waverly Sharing Garden is all about. We visited to see this inspiring program in action. The floods of 2008 devastated neighborhoods in Waverly, Iowa. When the water finally receded, many houses were torn down and some lots left empty. But Iowans are resourceful. In times of crisis, we pride ourselves on pulling together. And after the hard times, we pick up the pieces and figure out how to build our communities back up again. This was all flooded. The, this property had four houses on it and they had to be torn down because the, they were so bad. The area views, you could just you know, see some of the rooftops in some of the houses. The Waverly Community Sharing Gardens blossomed out of that disaster when city officials decided to not only repurpose formerly flooded city lots, but also to address an even bigger issue. When we first started, we looked at the, uh, um, the hunger issue in the community, and Waverly is not a poor community at all. It's relatively affluent, but we looked at the numbers of kids doing hot lunch programs, we talked to Northeast Iowa Food Bank. They've got statistics on how many people come to their facility or go to the food bank that's here. Uh, and they are hungry in Waverly. It's a very tight community. We like taking care of each other. And so I think the idea of, of providing more food for the food shelf was, you know, gladly accepted. Also, you know, we're a fairly agricultural place. And, you know, growing food, gardening, that's just sort of part of who we are. With help from the ISU Extension offices and other knowledgeable people, organizers of the Waverly Sharing Gardens recruited volunteers and began to fulfill their mission to grow fresh produce for the hungry using city land in community gardens. Oh, we grow a lot of stuff. Um, let's see, we have tomatoes, peppers, corn, cucumbers, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, I mean, the list can go on. <laughs> About half the food goes to the female programs, the other half goes to the food bank. We also uh, take food to the Sea Valley Friends of the Family shelter, and we've also taken food to the senior center before as well. For a lot of people who are on limited incomes, they want fresh produce, but it's often the most expensive for them to purchase. So rather than them spending their precious dollars on produce, they're able to come and get fresh produce that's really good for them. The Northeast Iowa Food Bank is one of several that serve Iowans. 
In a large refrigerated section of the food bank, they store the fresh, donated produce, including the fruits and veggies grown at the Waverly Gardens. The food bank has many distribution avenues, but with produce, the key is speed. Fresh produce is something that doesn't stay fresh very long, um, and we need to move it as fast as it comes in. When I go and I, I'm at a distribution, um, and I see kids and I see the produce out there, people are so excited to get it. We've been able this summer to offer a lot of wa watermelons, carrots, potatoes, green beans. They're very excited to see it um, because you know that's something that they wouldn't have had access to. And if we can help them eat healthier, we're all better off. Make somebody a good meal on it. Organizers of the Waverly Sharing Gardens Project say that getting enough volunteers to weed, water, and harvest can sometimes be a challenge. But it helps that volunteers can see the rewards and know that their time is worthwhile. We know that there are people in our communities, all communities, who are food insecure. They're not sure where their next meal is coming from. And to be able to give them fresh food rather than canned food is just so much better. Um, and that also allows them to prepare their own meals more than just opening cans. And it's, you know, many of the food insecure people are children, and so the parents are fixing them better food. I think my biggest reward is uh, seeing, seeing the people um, that the, the garden is helping, um, either if it's by uh, they're coming to volunteer um, for a certain reason or, um, or like, they need the meal because um, I, since I've been doing this, um, I've gotten invited to actually volunteer at one of the community meals so I can see where the produce is going, um, which has been really great because um, the extra produce that they don't use for the meal just gets set out so people can take it home with them. And like kids and even the elderly people are so excited to like see the fresh tomato or the fresh corn and it's, it's really good really rewarding. Donating to food banks or food pantries is not new. It started in the late 70s and early 80s. But the slight shift from shelf-stable foods to fresh is relatively new. And anyone who grows produce and has a little extra to give can donate it to any Iowa food bank or pantry and see it go to those in need. What we do is about helping so many people, but we can't do it without community support. So the community helps us out, and we're able to distribute it through a whole network of organizations. So I just look at what we do as a win-win for so many different people, whether it's the person who donates and volunteers to the person who receives the food. It's about bringing community together to make a difference. Wonderful. Well, now that you've seen some examples of what Master Gardeners are doing, and maybe these examples are directly from your community, I wanted you to take five minutes to do a small group discussion. The first question is, what are examples of this grow aspect of projects in your community? And the second question is, what are some potential partnerships to help with these projects? I'm going to start the timer, and you've got five minutes to discuss these questions. We'll come back in a second.
<laughs> Welcome back everyone to Best Practice uh, for Food Safety on the Farm. My name is Shannon Coleman and I'm an Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. My research area is food safety and consumer production, but I have research experience in the areas of rapid detection of foodborne pathogens and fresh produce from the, from the environment. So here's an overview of the presentation today, a brief overview of our presentation today. I will give you background information on foodborne pathogens and its effect on fresh produce. We will discuss developing a food safety plan. And then finally, I will give you best tips on best practices for food safety on the farm to consider. So first, let's start off with terms. Let's first familiarize ourselves with common food safety terms that will be used throughout this presentation. So first, we have food safety, which is monitoring of food to ensure that it will not cause foodborne illness. As far as foodborne illness goes, it is any illness that results from the consumption of contaminated foods. And then finally, the last term for food safety is pathogens, which are microorganisms that can cause disease. For our on-farm terms, we have here three listed. Um, first is good agriculture practices, which is agriculture man management practices that aid in reducing microbial risk as well as prevent contamination of fresh produce and vegetables on farm and in the packing house. Good handling practices are best practices for packing and storing, cleaning and sanitizing, and transporting fresh produce. And then finally, we have standard operating procedures, which are procedures in which farms and businesses use to properly complete a specific task. So when we're talking about food safety, we're talking about the type of contaminations that may occur. And types of contaminations are broken down into three categories. We have biological, chemical, and physical contaminations. We will cover some chemical and physical contaminations throughout the presentation. And right here are listed definitions and examples of those um, type of contaminations. But today we're going to go in depth about biological contaminants and how they are associated with fresh produce. As far as biological contaminants, they are microorganisms that are very small living organisms that can only be seen by the microscope, so which means you cannot see it with your naked eye. There are some harmless microorganisms out there, but we also have harmful microorganisms, as I mentioned before, with the pathogens, which may lead to illness, such as foodborne illness. Going more in depth with those microorganisms, um, there are three types of microorganisms um, that we should be concerned about, which are um, bacterial, viruses, parasites, and even fungi, but we're going to only gonna today talk about bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And they can be found various places along the environment, in food, and even humans may transmit them to food and cause someone to become ill. As far as bacteria goes, unlike animal and plants, which are made of many cells, bacteria are, is a single cell organism and a common form of bacteria that is generally associated with fresh produce is salmonella. The smallest organism that exists ever is um, a virus, which needs a host to replicate and a common form or a common example of a virus that's associated with fresh produce is hepatitis. A. And then finally, um, we have parasites, which are like viruses and bacteria where you can't see it with your naked eye. And it generally does not grow well in food. And usually the, re the way a parasite is transmitted to um, food is through humans um, transmitting the, um, the actual parasite um, to foods. So foodborne illness is a major call, is caused by foodborne pathogen and is a major issue in the United States. According to the CDC, one in every six person becomes ill from foodborne illness in the United States every year. And it is estimated that 48 million illnesses, 128,000 hospitalizations, and 3,000 deaths can um, occur in the United States each year. It is also estimated that 
Um, 46% of the food board illnesses in the United States between 1998 and 2008 were attributed to the consumption of fresh produce. And as producers of fresh produce, we must all be aware of the risk that we occur when dealing with fresh produce. So that's what we're going to talk about today in this um, particular presentation. So the harmful bacteria are pathogens that have been associated with um, fresh produce since the early 2000s. And in this table here, we have listed uh, multi-state outbreaks, and multi-state meaning that the outbreak of, uh, involves several states that have occurred since um, 2011. And as you can see here, you may see one that you recognize, such as listeria and cantaloupe outbreak that occurred in 2011. And then there may be some that you haven't heard of at all, such as hepatitis A being associated with um, an outbreak with pom pomegranate seeds. And as you can see, foodborne illness and fresh produce and outbreaks are a growing concern in the United States. And we want to make sure that at our end that we want to follow the best practices overall as far as food safety go to help prevent these events overall. So who are all, who are our, our vulnerable population as far as foodborne illnesses? Where well, our specific target audience for this program are generally susceptible to foodborne pathogens, which include those who are listed here, such as young children, individuals with immune deficiencies such as cancer and HIV patients, older adults, and pregnant women. So as we prepare to produce this great and quality produce, we also want to make sure that we're producing safe produce that we would distribute through the local food banks. Microorganisms can come in contact with fresh produce in various events. And this um, diagram that we see here, we're looking at um, contaminated irrigation water and processed water are as one of the major risks of contamination of fresh produce. And that could be due to the presence of domestic and wild animals or even workers having poor hygiene techniques. Other factors to consider um, that could pose a risk for contamination is along through it during the whole pre and post harvest process, such as harvesting and transporting the materials during the processing packaging um, part of the um, processing step at the actual distribution center or even having events at the actual restaurant, food service, or even at home. So we all must be aware of the risk that poses as far as food safety and the various points of contamination that may occur. So as mentioned before, food safety is a major concern with fresh produce and one of the reasons that is a major concern is due to the produce characteristics, such as produce growing closely to soil, which as I mentioned before, or, um, is that soil is a favorable condition for the growth of bacteria. Um, most farms are an open environment, which makes the produce susceptible to animal intrusion. Also, bacteria love specific characteristics of produce itself, such as it having a large surface area, its high moisture content, and also the favorable pH, which will allow the bacteria to grow. And the unique characteristics of produce, um, which um, we should be aware of, is that most produce is often consumed raw with minimal processing steps. And so considering all these characteristics, we must all be aware of the food safety concerns and make sure that we're growing our produce at the, at the highest quality and producing the safe produce. So I've given you all this information and it may be very overwhelming. So let's just stop at this moment right now and let me give you a few words of advice. So the overall goal of this project is to grow high quality and safe produce for our local food banks. And so today, I will assist you through this process by giving you goals as they relate to food safety. So let's start our conversation with me saying that the United States is attributed to having one of the safest food supplies in the world. 
and most and that is mostly contributed to the governmental agencies that we have, such as the FDA and USDA, constantly monitoring our food supply, which is why we have so many reports of outbreak investigations showing they're intervening and making sure that our food supply is safe um, throughout our country, and also uh, monitoring what else um, the products that come in as well. So as a food safety expert, I put myself at ease as far as practicing food, sa food safety at home, such as I, wash, I practice washing my hands and produce, maintaining um, clean food um, surface contacts, food contact surfaces, and separating raw and cooked foods to reduce contamination, as well as monitoring the temperature of my final product. So my advice with you, to you as we move along in this presentation is to not to panic. That I will give you tips that, will, that you can start implementing food safety practices to help ensure that you produce quality and, and a safe food supply um, from your garden. So let's get started with um, starting a, developing a food safety plan. So many of the tips that I'll be given in the next couple of slides can be find, found in the ISU Extension publication, which is available on the web. And this publication um, covers food safety concerns as related to fresh produce and gives an in-depth examples of um, gaps, good, agri good agriculture practices, as well as gives in-depth um, tips in developing a food safety plan. So what is a food safety plan? A food safety plan can be developed as a roadmap for your operation to actively re reduce risk that may, je that may jeopardize your product safety. The plan can include various checkpoints so, and monitoring mechanisms to verify the steps taken. Um, also, changes can be made to improve the quality and safety of your actual product at the end. A comprehensive food safety plan will include the components listed here. Some of the tips that I will mention in depth throughout this presentation will involve um, um, specific components listed here such as employee training, product handling, and cleaning and sanitation. For example, as a part of your food safety plan, you should plan to train your volunteers or gardeners on proper hand washing techniques and having um, proper hygienic um, practices. Listed here are steps um, that can be considered in developing your food safety plan, which can include listing pre and post harvest handling practices, measuring and monitoring risk, modifying and um, modifying steps to reduce the risk throughout your process, and most importantly, documenting all steps. Documenting your practices ensures that the practices have been performed. So that is something that I would really like to stress to you is that make sure, making sure that you have some form of documentation that shows that you're incorporating food safety um, practices on your farm. So record keeping is key. As I mentioned before in the previous slide, documentation and record, record um, keeping is a key component in developing your food safety plan. So where do you start? ISU Extension and Outreach also has a checklist document that can be used as a resource to help you as far as starting your food safety plan. The topics listed here are the topics covered in the document. And although this document is adapted to those who are um, purchasing from a retail setting, it can be adapted to our practices as far as donating to the local food banks due to that we also want to make sure that we're um, developing and creating and producing high quality products for our target audience. So this is a good way to start as far as your food safety plan and something I would re recommend for you to use throughout this process. Um, as a checklist to um, ensure that you're following good, pra good agriculture practices um, with, on your farm. If you would like to go in more in depth as far as developing a food safety plan for your long-term use, 
Iowa State Uni University Extension and Outreach on Farm Food Safety Team has GAP training available in the next couple of months. So they have both level one and level two that will be um, in, that will be um, presented in these two areas, Crisco and Bloomfield. The level one training covers increasing knowledge on on-farm food hazards and good agriculture practices, basic food microbiology knowledge, increased wellness of regulations for selling fresh produce and light processing. And then in level two, it covers increased knowledge of hazards on their farms, um, allows you to develop a food safety plan with detailed control measures employed on your farm, and increased knowledge of market potentials and needs to expand. So in the actual level one, they generally go over um, the hazards and talk about um, the beginning parts of the food safety plan, and in level two, you actually get one-on-one -on -one help with developing your food safety plan. So if these um, opportunities are located near you and you want to develop that in-depth food safety plan, I would encourage you to attend. The cost of each workshop is $55 for an individual, and there is a $10 discount for attending more than one workshop. And this may be a good opportunity to use as far as your mini grant, using your funds to um, attend these trainings and um, gain more knowledge about food safety plans. Now the moment that we've all been waiting for, um, what are the best practices for on-farm food safety? So overall, we have an outline that will cover pre-harvest, harvesting in the field, post-harvest, and then finally, transportation. So first, let's begin with pre-harvest, where I will cover workers' health and hygiene and toilet and hand washing facilities. So worker hygiene and health is a major concern in the spread of foodborne pathogens. All volunteers or gardeners must attend regular training focusing on good personal hygiene, hand washing, and which are all um, given by designated trainers. They also must be trained on how to develop, how to handle injuries and illnesses in the case of an accident. And there also must be proper signage posted that can serve as a consistent reminder of poor hygiene and how to properly um, enforce it as far as on-farm food safety practices. And of course, ISU Extension and Outreach Food Safety Team has examples of signage and on their Extension website, which you can post around your hand washing station, which can offer you hand washing tips, as well as the poster on um, the other side, which um, talks about those specific pathogens that I mentioned before and where they favor in your particular parts of your hands. So if you're looking for actual signage, they're already developed and you can um, print them off and post them around your hand washing stations. So when it comes to your toilet and hand washing stations, there are a few things to consider. Starting with making sure that your facilities are clean and maintained, keeping them stocked with supplies, and for the location of the facility is very um, important as it's related to your production and handling area. You want to make sure that it is, it is at least a quarter mile away from your working area and that portable facilities must be isolated and away from your production facilities. Systems also must be set in place to help maintain your facilities, such as having systems set in place for collecting gray water from your portable facilities, having an emergency plan in case of um, contamination and spilling, and have a regular maintenance of your portable facilities and in a physically isolated area. The most important thing to note here is just make sure that there's also in a sufficient amount of toilets and hand washing stations per every gardener and volunteer. Moving on to production practices, where well, we will cover water quality, manure, and animal presence. As I mentioned before, water plays a major role in the contamination of fresh produce 
And so we want to make sure that the water quality is a major um, um, issue that we concern as far as um, we address as far as our food safety plan. So to start, the irrigation or spray water sources must be from a municipal treated or groundwater with a well capped um, that is well capped and in good condition. If you are on municipal water or tested water, it is those testing is um, testing is performed annually, so you shouldn't be, really be concerned about um, testing your water. But if you're on groundwater, it is recommended that you test your water for generic E. coli regularly. And you also want to monitor your water source for high turbidity and cloudiness. And it's also recommended that drip irrigation of water is used for produce crops to reduce the risk of contamination. When rinsing your produce, you want to make sure that your water temperature is also slightly warmer than the produce to help prevent thermal shock and an absorption of water or bacteria inside of the actual produce itself. So here are resources um, as far as water testing locally. Um, we have the State Hygienic Laboratory, which can serve as a resource, as well as listed here are three um, private laboratories here in Iowa that you can use as far as testing services. Moving on to manure use, although I know it's general practice for master gardeners not to use raw manure, I just wanted to make sure that we go over those best practices for the, um, just so you're aware of the best practices for manure use in fresh produce. So this includes um, some of the tips that are listed here, um, such as applying, a applying um, raw manure at least 120 days before harvesting and using cover crops, crops, no, cover crops as a boundary for um, your produce. Please note that with whatever fertilizer that you're using, that you use it at the, at the proper standard as recommended by the manufacturer as far as your fertilizer and as far as food safety practices. As mentioned before, um, a source of contamination could be, um, as far as food safety concern, could be the presence of animals. And so best practices for reducing um, the risk of um, animal present is restricting access, performing and monitoring activities weekly through inspections, and reducing attractants as far as um, standing water, coal piles, and nesting areas. And overall, you just want to continuously monitor your area and make sure that animals are not intruding your areas. So let's take a break and discuss recommendations for container gardens. I think in previous um, webinars, they mentioned um, container gardeners. And so overall, here, here are some examples or here are some recommendations for container gardeners. So overall, you want to use a you want to use food grade materials, being whether it's a commercial, commercially produced container. It can be a five gallon bucket, or it can be a porous material such as clay or wood. And you want you want to avoid using containers that have been treated, such as treated lumber, or plastics that are used for outdoors, and even tire tire truck tires are not permitted or not recommended to be used as containers for container gardeners, gardens for produce. Now we're moving on to harvest and field where we will talk in depth about sanitation. So overall we want to provide quality and safe produce to our food bank so we want to consider these sanitation um, tips in the field while harvesting such as Avoid harvesting bruised and dropped produce. Cull any produce with evidence of animal feces or feeding marks. Regularly maintain your harvesting aids by washing and sanitizing them before um, using them for harvesting as needed throughout and after harvesting. And then remind all volunteers and gardeners to practice proper hand washing stations, hand washing practices before working with your produce, 
before and after meals, and after toilet use. And we want to make sure that we maintain clean working gloves, or if you're using disposable gloves, make sure that you change them um, throughout the whole harvesting process. Now that we have harvested the product, we want to make we want to take a few precautions as they relate to the bins and containers that are used for harvesting. So we want to make sure that the volunteers do not stand on the bins. We want to use new containers if available, or if we're reusing containers, we want to make sure that they're washed, rinsed, and sanitized prior to use. During storage, we want to make sure that the containers are covered in, in the isolated area. And then finally, we want to make sure that we remove all soil from the produce, as well as the bins in the field, to, by rinsing, washing, and sanitizing before and after field use. ISU Station and Ad Outreach has another great resource as far as sanitizers that can be used on the farm. Listed here are um, recommendations such as using quads or even chlorine as um, recommended sanitizers. So overall, we want to consider for our sanitizers that we use the um, sanitizers that are approved for food contact use. Use it at the correct um, concentration level to be effective and dis discharge of any um, sanitizer as needed. So if um, you run out or if you think that it should be refreshed, make sure that you refresh um, the sanitizer and have it at the effective concentration before using it again as a sanitizing agent. And that um, publication can be found at the web link listed here. Moving on to post-harvest practices, in this section we're going to talk about handling of produce, cooling, and uh, give recommendations for storage and packing materials. So many of the post-harvest practices are similar to the field um, sanitation practices as far as using, at this end you're going to use potable water for rinsing your fresh produce. And there are some repeat practices as far as using new or if you're using reused containers, making sure that they have been inspected, rinsed, and sanitized um, prior to use, as well as when storing your containers, making sure that they're in an isolated area and covered. Moving on to cooling, after you have properly harvested your produce, the next step is post-harvest cooling which should occur rapidly um, which would which is used to rapidly remove field heat and field heat can reduce um, the storage life of the vegetable if it's not fruit and vegetable if it's not removed immediately um, a good management stat strategy um, to reduce field heat in harvesting temperature is to um, harvest early um, in the morning or late at night. And proper post-harvest cooling can suppress enzymatic degradation and respiration activity, slow and inhibit water loss, slow and inhibit decay, producing microorganisms such as mold and bacteria, reduce production of ethylene, or minimize um, products reaction to ethylene. So cooling should occur immediately after washing at a controlled storage. The storage area must be cleaned regularly. And do not overfill your, co your cooling storage. Um, plan accordingly and to the, um, as far as your quantity that you want to add to your cooling storage. And there are critical temperatures to consider when cooling. You want to maintain the refrigerated items at 41 degrees or um, Fahrenheit or below. And the danger zone for bacteria to grow is between 41 and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which is um, favorable for growth of bacteria. And both respiration and bacteria can grow rapidly between the temperatures of 70 and 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And another great resource to use from ISU Extension and Outreach, which will be useful for our program, is the Fresh Vegetable Guide, which gives a description of 
the qual the quality that you want of your fresh vegetable as well as common um, storage chips that can be used. So listed here are the quality and storage chips of fresh produce that will be grown at the ISU Demonstration Garden. For example, the peak quality of carrots um, is that you want to have a firm, bright color orange, smooth and well-shaped carrot. And the harvest, after harvesting the carrot, it can last about a week at refrigerated temperatures. Another example is onions, where you want to, as far as quality go, you want a blemish-free, dry, shiny, firm, and a tightly closed neck, neck um, as far as your onion. And you want to store them at, in a woven bag or in, in a dark, cool area. Moving on to other examples, um, potatoes, you want them to be firm, smooth, with few eyes, and blemish free, with no sprouts, soft spots, or it have a green color, and they should also be stored in a cool and dry place. Moving on to our containers that we will use um, as far as um, harvesting and storage and transportation. Uh, proper storage and package containers is a must as far as protecting the integrity of your final product. So common recommendations for food storage containers is that you want to have a food grade quality storage and once again you want to maintain that integrity of your actual product because we want to um, create high, we want to produce high quality um, fresh produce. For example, the containers here in the pictures are harvesting lugs that are shown. So those are one of the recommended um, forms of storage um, containers that can be used as far as harvesting and transportation of your fresh produce. Moving on to transportation. The Leopold Center in ISU Extension and Outreach has a great resource um, that covers food safety topics, the food safety that topics that we, dis that we discussed today as they relate to food pantry donations and they can be found at the website um, listed here. And it also gives a good example as far as record keeping which will be good as far as traceability, um, tracing the fresh produce back to the specific farm that donated that, um, that commodity. As for transportation goes with fresh produce to food banks, we want to consider the, the following. Taking precaution to minimize the hazards that we mentioned before, the biological, chemical, and physical hazards, as well as for the vehicle used for transportation should be covered, odor and debris free, clean and sanitized to help maintain the produce integrity. And we also want to make sure that the vehicle is kept at a proper temperature to help reduce time and temperature abuse. So once again, as far as food safety plans go, if you wanted to develop a more in-depth food safety plan, we have those GAP trainings that are coming up in February and March in Crisco and Bloomfield. And once again, the cost is $55 individually. And if you um, attend both trainings, you do get a discount of $10 um, per the second um, training, as well as as a part of this GAP series as well, if you're interested about creating market-ready uh, fresh produce, there is a market-ready component that is also a part of this training. So the take-home message is, through our program with Stamp Ed and Master Gardeners, we want to make sure that we're, cre that we're developing and producing quality and safe fresh produce for our um, food banks in our areas. And we all want to consider all those food safety points um, discussed today as far as pre-harvest, harvesting in the field, post-harvest and transportation, and covering topics such as training, training workers and, and volunteers on hand washing techniques, using the proper sanitizer, at the proper sanitation um, concentration and making sure that our vehicle that we're using for transporting our fresh produce is clean and covered and using the proper um, containers in our container gardeners that are food grade as well as for transportation of our fresh produce to the banks. 
Here are my references that I used um, for to develop um, this presentation, and they came from Colorado State, Iowa State. Okay. If you have further questions about um, farm food safety tips and would like to get um, help in that area, um, my contact information is listed here as far as my email. And um, just contact me if you have those questions. And now we're transitioning once again into our small groups where we will be discussing what best practices for food safety does, does our garden or project already use and what practices do we need to improve or add. Anchor up on Aldi. 